In the previous video, we looked at a number of different processes that can be used to form metals, and in particular we looked at forging, extrusion and drawing. Now in order for these processes to be used, it was reliant on the fact that the metal was malleable and ductile, so we can use forming processes on soft malleable ductile metals. On the right hand side here we see an example of one of those processes, this is direct extrusion, where we have the billet or the material that's being extruded, and that material is being forced through the die using a ram. So the material needs to be soft and malleable in order to be deformed and forced through the die where the extruded product will have a different cross section to the original billet. We looked at another example and here we saw the process of drawing and drawing was similar to extrusion except the material or the workpiece was being pulled through the die rather than forced through the die or pushed through the die. So here the material needed to be ductile in order to be drawn into a wire. But there are some other important considerations when using forming processes, and one of those considerations relates to something called work hardening. So basically what happens is when this material is either forced or pulled through the die, it undergoes plastic deformation in the region here. Now as a result of that plastic deformation, the properties of the material actually change. And the properties change because of something called work hardening, where the material exiting the die is going to be harder and stronger than the material entering the die. And in this video we're going to take a look at the reasons why work hardening occurs as the material plastically deforms moving through the die. Now a good starting point for understanding this is to look at a stress strain graph. And here we have an example of a stress strain graph for 7030 brass. Now this particular graph was taken from some test data and when we analysed this in an earlier unit we mentioned that this first part of the graph can be disregarded because this is where the chucks of the UTS test machine was picking up tension and the material was settling into the chucks. But this next region is important. This next region here is where elastic deformation occurs or temporary deformation. Now when elastic deformation occurs, the material is being stretched, it's increasing in length, but if we remove the forces, it will return right back to its original length. If we think back to the structure of the material, the layers of the material are not sliding over each other within the elastic region. Yes, they're stretching and displacing, but they're remaining in their same orientation. However, when we reach this point here, this is the yield strength of the material. This is where the material no longer elastically deforms and begins instead to plastically deform. Now for this particular material, we see that occurring at around 180 megapascals. So at 180 megapascals of stress, the layers of the material begin to slide over one another and we begin to get plastic deformation. Now this graph illustrates work hardening or work strengthening really well because if the material yields, or fails at 180 megapascals, then we would expect all of the layers of the material to slide over each other at 180 megapascals. So at 180 megapascals, any incremental increase in stress would cause more layers to slide over one another, leading to further deformation. We would expect this graph to continue moving horizontally to the right, where the same stress causes additional strain or additional deformation. But that isn't the case. We see here, at a stress of 180 megapascals, that plastic deformation begins. The layers of the material begin to slide over one another. But 180 megapascals is no longer sufficient to continue that process. We need 250 megapascals to cause additional deformation. We need 350 megapascals to continue deformation. And it isn't until we get to around 450 megapascals of stress that no further increase of stress is required to continue plastic deformation. So now at 450 megapascals, the layers are sliding freely over one another until the material eventually necks and fails. So what we see here is work hardening in action, because if the material didn't work harden or work strengthen, then plastic deformation would continue at 180 megapascals before failure. So let's look at what's actually occurring within the material at the yield point. 
So when we've spoken previously about plastic deformation, we've talked about layers of material sliding over one another. And on the top left hand side here, we have a diagram which illustrates something called edge dislocation. And where edge dislocation occurs, the top layer of this piece of material is sliding relative to the bottom layer of the material. It's a kind of shearing action. Directly underneath that, we have something called a screw dislocation, where the front of the top layer of the material is moving relative to the back and relative to the bottom of the material. What we have here is kind of a twisting action where the top layer is being twisted anti-clockwise relative to the bottom layer. So the deformation is greater at the front edge than it is at the back edge here. Now when we look on a smaller scale on the right hand side, the deformation appears the same. These two images here would represent a small segment at the front of the dislocation but the impact varies with the depth of the material. On the right hand side, we can see our screw dislocation in a bit more detail because what we see is the front top layer being displaced relative to the bottom layer, but also being displaced relative to the back of the material. And in plan view, we see that the layers of the material are no longer neatly aligned. Now recall that we said in order for a material to be malleable and ductile, the layers of the material must be able to slide freely over one another. Now as soon as these dislocations begin occurring, it's going to affect the slip planes and it's going to make it harder for the layers of the material to slide relative to one another. Now this effect here is actually compounded in a piece of material and the reason for that is as follows. When a piece of metal is molten and it solidifies, we get the formation of grains. So in the top left hand corner we would have a grain forming as it solidifies and in the top right hand corner we would have a grain forming as it solidifies there. When those two grains solidify sufficiently to meet we end up with these grain boundaries and the layers of the material are not necessarily orientated from one grain to the next. Now if they are neatly orientated as we see in the top left and top right here any dislocation in the first grain is going to naturally impact on the second grain. But the same might not be true for dislocations occurring in the bottom grain. These may slide in a different direction. So what we end up with is the dislocations in one grain impacting on another, but over time what we can end up with is an interlocking of these grains. Now any interlocking here is going to make it harder for the layers of each grain to slide over one another, and it's going to make it harder for the layers of the material to slide over one another. Hence why we get this effect of work hardening or work strengthening as the layers of the material slide relative to one another. So let's think back to the process of drawing then. In the drawing process, we want to form a piece of wire. So coming out of the die on the right hand side, we want a narrower cross section than the material going into the die. So the material going in is soft, malleable and ductile. We get work hardening through the die. So the material coming out is less malleable and less ductile. If we want to reduce the cross section of that material further, then we have a problem. But it isn't something that we can't overcome. We can actually use a heat treatment process known as annealing. And we're going to look at annealing a bit more in a later tutorial. But essentially what we can do is we can pass the material through the die, it becomes less malleable and less ductile. We can apply the heat treatment known as annealing and the properties of the material exiting the die will be restored it will return to being a soft, malleable, ductile material. We can then pass it through a second die, repeating the drawing process and reducing the cross section further. And if that material becomes less malleable and less ductile, once again, we can repeat our annealing process. So to summarize, when we carry out various different forming processes, such as forging, extrusion and drawing, we often get work hardening, which is as a direct result of the plastic deformation occurring within the die. However, work hardening can be overcome using the heat treatment process of annealing, which we're going to look at in greater detail in the next video.